Thank you so much, Holland, and welcome everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you. Even though it's virtual, it's just really nice to know that there's a community of people that are really appreciating nature right now. Of all times, we are so grateful to be in California and be able to enjoy our outdoor spaces. And so today what I want to do is just really take you on a tour of California's grasslands and share with you my passion for this really critical ecosystem, share with you the excitement that I see when I'm out there counting grasses and looking at them, and also talk to you about that intersection between our science and our land management and stewardship, which is a really critical role that Pepperwood has within our region. So here, let's, let's go for it. So zooming out to the global perspective, we have these major vegetation categories called biomes and grasslands here are pictured in the yellow to tan color throughout the world. Grasslands cover about 40% of the land mass of the earth. So they're quite prolific. And even though we have just these kind of four main categories or biomes that include grasslands, Grasslands are really represented throughout all of these biomes. Grasslands are found in forest floors and the understory, they're found in wetlands, they're found all over the world. Grasslands are vast, they're sweeping. I love when the wind just ripples through them. They, the grasslands will often merge with you know, mountains on the horizon and the shrubs in the foreground. Grasslands are diverse and they're not just full of grasses such as this tall grass prairie picture you see here. This prairie is filled with tons of wildflowers. Grasslands are idyllic, lush, green. That green color just, it feels so good to look at. Or they're rustling and brown such as our Mediterranean grasslands you see here at Pepperwood in this late summer photo um, with really hardy, late blooming plants that are completely drought resistant that are blooming in later you know, July or August, such as this gumweed. Grasslands are dynamic and they operate on really small scales. So you can take a few steps in one direction and be in a completely different grassland community than, than what you were just standing in. And oftentimes grasslands are overlooked. People will often look out on the hills and go, oh yeah, it's green. You know, there's some trees and rocks and beautiful clouds. But when I look at this as an ecologist, I see a lot going on here. I see areas that are drying down faster that probably have shallow soils and really pretty wildflowers in spring. I see shrubs encroaching into the grasslands. I see thatch, this dry material building up I see lush green areas, probably where there's more water availability from seeps or springs. And this lush green here, I do know at Pepperwood, this is actually an invasive perennial grass called harding grass that occupies more of our wet slopes. So this is something that we are actively managing for. Grasslands are pastoral. They provide a, an immense amount of food for humans. Over 70% of our agricultural crops are grasses. Corn, rice, wheat provide more than 50% of human consumed calories. And it's kind of ironic that our tall grass prairie in the US is being replaced by a tall grass monoculture such as corn. This here is a family tree, evolutionary tree and the branch that has these green leaves on it represent organisms that have chloroplasts, allowing them to produce food from sunlight. And grasses here are right at the tip. They're a relatively recently emerged grouping of plants. And grasses are the fifth largest plant family in the world with over 12,000 species. The plant family name for grasses is Poaceae, which is derived from ancient Greek for the word fodder, food. 
Now, what do dinosaurs have to do with grasses? My son, who's five, loves this part of this presentation. So um, in 2003, there was a recently discovered hadrosaur, which is a duck-billed plant-eating dinosaur. And this particular hadrosaur is from about 120 million years ago from the Cretaceous period. And paleontologists studied the coprolite, which is fossilized dinosaur poop. And they looked inside that dinosaur poop and they found what are called phytoliths. Phyto meaning plant, lith meaning rock. These are little silica bodies or crystals that grasses make. Grasses are prolific with silica. They have a lot of these phytoliths. And oftentimes um, these phytoliths will have certain shapes that can tell you uh, what plants they're associated with. And when they looked inside this coprolite, they found phytoliths that indicate that this particular species of hadrosaur was feeding on ancient relatives of bamboo and rice. Grasses have a really unique anatomy. In fact, it makes a lot of botanists a little crazy because you have to learn a whole new terminology when you're trying to identify them. But I find them remarkable. Most plants grow from the tip. They usually have their apical meristems at the top of the plant. Grasses, however, have their meristematic tissue down low. So, and meristematic tissue, I should say, is where, you know, cells can divide and keep growing. So if it's cut back, that's the location it grows from. Now, and there's also nodes that do that too along the stems. But the meristematic tissue of grasses is down here at the base. And so if this whole plant gets chomped on, it can completely regrow from the ground up. They have really unique ways of vegetatively reproducing through stolons or rhizomes underground, as well as reproductively through their, their seeds that they produce. They are a flowering plant. Indeed, grasses have flowers. They are not showy, however, and that's because they are adapted to pollinate each other through wind. They passively dangle out all their reproductive parts and allow the wind to do their business for them. So here are male flower parts called anthers that produce pollen. And in this picture, they've already opened up and released their pollen to the wind. And then these more feathery crystalline structures you see here are the female pistil parts. And each one of these, I should say, is a floret in a spikelet. Now, these are not showy because they don't need to attract pollinators. They don't need to expend all that energy producing, you know, particular parts shaped for certain pollinators or colors or, you know, that's very expensive biologically. So this is a pretty, um, it, it, even though it seems simple, it's a pretty advanced way of, of doing reproduction. And for those of you with allergies, I'm sorry to say it's because of these non-showy plants like grasses and pines or oaks or acacias that you are suffering from your allergies. So California grasslands, your grasslands are extremely dynamic and complex. And so they're very hard to characterize or categorize. So we tend to think of grasslands grouped in more of these you know, regional categories such as valley and south coastal grasslands. We have north coastal grasslands here, including where pepperwood occurs. We have cold desert, warm desert, and then serpentine grasslands, which are spotted along the coastline. Serpentinite is a type of rock that is formed deep beneath the ocean and through you know, uplifting of tectonic plates and erosion, there's locations along the coastal California areas where that rock becomes exposed. And serpentinite is very toxic to a lot of plants. Its chemical composition is not preferred by most plants. But what that's done is it's allowed some plants to find it as a refugia or even they're endemic to it. They require serpentine and only occur on that. And these are places with um, high endemism, high biodiversity, and Pepperwood does have some serpentine grasslands that we're very proud of. Here are some visual representations of these different types, valley and south coastal grasslands, the more cool adapted north coastal grasslands with these um, native perennial bunch grasses. This is California oak grass here, along with some coyote brush. 
cool desert grasslands, warm desert, and then that serpentine I mentioned. Now, California um, has over 300 native grasses. These are grassland species that have occurred in California for a very long time, if not have originated from this region. Native grassland communities support over 40% of our native species in California, plant species. And 90% of our rare plant species reside in grasslands. They are some of the most diverse communities in our state if not the world. Now, of course, that's the good news. The bad news is that our grasslands have been reduced by 99%. These are native grasslands. I'm not talking about the grasslands you see that are invaded by European annual grasses or the grasslands that have been invaded by humans too, right? So out of that 1%, 88% that remain are privately owned. We don't know the status of them or how they're being stewarded or whether or not they're gonna to convert to, you know, more of these homes here. And it makes sense. I mean, grasslands are a lot easy to, easier to build and develop and occupy. They often occur in valley floors. Um, so it just makes sense that humans have colonized those areas. But when you see a blank field that just looks green to you, I hope that after today's uh, presentation, you'll take a closer look and realize how abundant and beautiful and important that little pasture may be. So here is uh, th that picture again of a coastal California grassland. And I wanna talk to you about the importance of these native perennial bunch grasses that you see here. One thing to note is that they often provide space in between each other space for other things, wildflowers, maybe even a little bare ground for a burrow. Um, they don't create a monoculture like you see with our annual European grasses. In this image here, there's obviously non-grass species because these have showy flowers, but the actual perennial bunch grasses that are shown here um, really illustrate how perennial grasses can survive our dry, you know, rainless summer months in our Mediterranean ecosystem. To stay alive without months of water, you have to tap into water somehow. And so perennial bunch grasses have roots that go deep down into the soil, sometimes meters deep. They um, pump carbon into those deep soils, enriching the soils. They percolate water. They help water infiltration get deep down in there. They stabilize soils. And again, they provide space for other things to co-occur. And, and I actually have heard, I think, Stipa pulchra purple needle grass, which I'll show you in a, a little bit, um, can sometimes live up to 100 plus years. These are long lived plants, very hardy and good at surviving our harsh Mediterranean conditions. So here's that purple needle grass I was mentioning. This is one of the most abundant and ubiquitous uh, perennial bunch grasses in California. It's also our state grass. And this, these are the plants that you can find at Pepperwood. And for those of you, I know there's a lot of gardeners or people interested in landscaping, possibly in the audience. This is a grass that's really easy to propagate. We collect seeds every year from this plant and grow it up in our shade house and greenhouse for our grassland restoration. Um, we plant plugs most often and it does really well. This here is um, that coastal bunch grass that I showed you earlier, California oat grass. Here is California fescue. It's really lovely and often is found under um, oak woodlands and more shaded areas. Blue wild rye, which you'll find growing between that transition zone between oak woodlands and meadows big squirrel tail grass, a very showy, lovely grass that will dot even open, open grassland areas. And then Pepperwood's tiny little annual native grass, a small fescue. This one turns a really brilliant burgundy late in the summer. So some historical ecologists um, believe that California was dominated by perennial bunch grasses originally before um, European settlement. And then others might have been speculating, well, it might also have been dominated by wildflowers. 
such as we see here with this super bloom in the Carrizo Plain. You know, the, and that kind of makes sense. Maybe it was also, there's the spectrum, right? There's all the bunch grasses, there's all the wildflowers, and then there's everything in between co-occurring. And these super blooms have been getting a lot of media attention. They are just phenomenal. They're even visible from space, as we see here. These are poppies in Walker Canyon. Now, Pepperwood, we have our own super blooms, but on a much smaller scale. Um, and especially after fire, we see a really nice prolific uh, bloom display following fire. These plants here that you see are California gold fields with some blue-eyed grass, which is not a grass because it has showy petals, right? It's pollinated by pollinators, not by the wind. And here's more blue-eyed grass up close. It's related to iris and blue-eyed marys. This is one of my favorites. This is um, bird's eye gilia and it's beautiful blue pollen. To really appreciate grasslands, you gotta get down. You gotta get on your knees and your belly and look around. Here's another little annual that's very dear to me called Leptosiphon. There's various common names depending on the species, whisker brush, false baby stars. And lepto means long, siphon means tube. This is a floral tube with a nectary reward at the base. So if you're a pollinator like this California ringlet that lives its entire life cycle in grasslands, you might very well feed on leptosiphon. Dusky wing and blues are often found, you know, hopping around, flittering around our, our wildflowers and clovers. Then there's the predators that lurk in wait, such as this orb weaver or this cryptic stalker. And oftentimes when I'm working in our grasslands, you know, digging down, looking at the individual species, I find leftover exuvia or exoskeletons of wolf spiders. This time of year, the harvester ants are very busy gathering seeds with their, their um, you know, trail they have here. And they often will deposit nitrogen as well as leftover seeds. And you'll often see these kind of tufts or mounds of green diversity of wildflowers right around their, their burrows. And then of course we love our praying mantises, even though they're non-native, they're so much fun to see in our grasslands. And the birds that require grasslands for life as well, such as our Western meadowlark. These are ground nesting birds that will put nests on, you know, next to larger bunch grasses or rushes. We also have ravens in our grasslands. I should mention these are images from our wildlife camera research program that we have. Western bluebirds, some introduced species utilizing our grasslands, including wild turkey and our cattle. And then a visitor that we've been seeing every year for a few years now that comes over to stop and rest for a few weeks and have shelter. This is a threatened burrowing owl. And it comes to the same place. We don't know if it's the same individual, but it has been coming to the same location. And we did see this one just a few weeks ago. And of course, our top predators like our hawks, coyote, bobcats, and even puma moving through the open in the middle of the day. It does happen. <laughs> And skunks, if you've ever been, you know, by a pasture where there's cattle or other, you know, cow or animal droppings, if you see them flipped over, it's most likely from a busy skunk the night before, flipping them over and eating the lovely grubs and beetles that can be found. And then this here is a digging from a North American badger. Um, badger were hunted by, you know, mostly ranchers because their holes um, are a threat for injury, a risk of injury for cattle and livestock. And unfortunately, they were hunted, and yet we're the first sighting east of Highway 101 in Sonoma County that has documented the return of North American badger. And here's one of our wildlife camera pictures from 2013. If you look really carefully here, there's kind of a sausage shape with a white stripe down the back. That is a North American badger coming through. And since then, we've caught some nicer pictures, but this is our first, and we were very excited about it. 
So how do we go from this really diverse, tiny miniature forest beneath our feet with all of these organisms scurrying about, pollinators, invertebrates, birds, wildflowers, perennial bunch grasses that provide space for other things to coexist, to this, the invaded Golden Hills of California. They weren't always this way. These are recently introduced invasive plants that make, make this characteristic, you know, golden hue. Well, uh, paleobotanists and historical ecologists will talk to you about the Spanish influx in the, the um, 1800s, and you can actually follow the mission line and look at the contents within the adobe bricks and see after time when these uh, European grasses were introduced, most likely along with, you know, they were brought with the Spanish along with their livestock. So the forage quality of California's grasslands was probably not optimal for the sheep and other animals that they brought with them. So of course they would bring the seeds and the food, the fodder, um, that that was you know best for their for their livestock. So at Pepperwood, um, we have we're a 3,200 acre preserve, and we have about 900 acres of grasslands. This is a an aerial image of Pepperwood. Here's the entrance road, the barn, and here's the Dwight Center right here where I am sitting at today, giving you this presentation. And when I first arrived at Pepperwood almost 10 years ago, our preserve manager you know, was talking to me about how we really wanted to put together a grassland monitoring program and how they had recently been asking the question, a very important question, have Pepperwood's grasslands always been grasslands? Or were they once forested and perhaps you know, the trees might've been cut down for agriculture? Um, there are homesteads on the property, so perhaps they might have removed trees. So this is a very important question. If you're going to be stewarding land and managing land, you want to look back in the history and get a sense of what was there before. You also want to look ahead and think about what is coming with climate change and other variables and, you know, make the best decisions you can with the information you have. Well, we contracted with a local historical ecologist, Arthur Dawson, and he reoccupied the 1850 census locations on the preserve. He'd go and find the survey marker. He would read the you know, historical documentation and look out on the land and see if he was seeing the same stuff that was being described in those records. And most of what he saw, the rolling, vast, sweeping grasslands, where it was described is what he saw currently as well. We also contracted with Rand Evett, who's a scientist out of UC Berkeley, who studies phytoliths, those silica bodies that grasses make. Remember those little crystals I mentioned before? He specializes in studying those shapes, densities, and distributions of these silica bodies. And he took soil cores throughout Pepperwood, where you know that soil core is essentially a record through time the deeper you go. And he wanted to help us determine whether or not um, locations where we had bunch grasses and grasslands historically had grasslands. And what they found is that about between 1942 and 2000, about 10% of our grasslands had actually been reduced, lost. So the blue in this map are places that um, had grasslands in 2000 and 1942 is the gold that you see here. So there, there were historically more grasslands. They also found that based on the phytolith survey, indeed, there were similar species and distributions in the past as we currently see. So based on that information, we went, all right, we really, instead of planting trees and trying to convert our grasslands to woodlands, we need to manage our grasslands as grassland. And what that requires is disturbance. Grasslands are adapted to disturbance and if you don't have disturbance, what you get, you get shrubs moving in and then you get forest after that. That's a, a standard progression through vegetation communities called succession. And historically, there used to be large ungulates that would migrate through the region, you know, foraging, browsing, grazing their way through. And so 
one of the disturbance tools we use today are cattle. We do graze the preserve. We also use fire. So here's a picture of a uh, cow fire team. This is our very first prescribed fire we conducted in 2016. And we were targeting this, I think it was just like a five acre or so area this first round. Um, we were targeting an invasive grass called Medusa head. So this is an annual grass that will really take over, has a lot of thick thatch, um, and that thatch is material that will just lay down over time. It crowds out other species. It shades out everything from getting access to sunlight underneath so you don't get much germination. And it produces a fuel. It's a fine fuel that can um, increase fire risk and fire behavior. So there's a lot of research on this invasive grass on how fire, repeated burns, as well as mowing or other methods can reduce its, its seed and you can get a decrease in its presence. A good thing about Medusa head is that it holds onto its seeds longer than the native wildflowers and native grasses. So when we burn for this plant in June, already those wildflower seeds have already dropped, the native seeds have, native grasses have already dropped their seed, and so a fire won't harm those individuals. But if you burn slowly and with flame lengths that are just right, you can actually kill off a majority of these Medusa head seeds. Here's a map of the spring right before the fire, the burn that we did. The black dots are areas where Medusa head did not occur and then on up to these larger red ones where there was an abundance of Medusa head. So this is right before the fire and this is the spring following. Just one fire did a really good job at reducing the numbers. And we did go back and repeat a, a second burn in order to control for this grass species. Now what, there's also wildfire, right? So we have our tool of prescribed burning, but then there's also nature doing its job. And especially with our more arid conditions in California, of course, we're seeing a lot longer, you know, fire window, um, more extreme fire behavior, and it's it's actually quite um, quite tragic that people are experiencing this throughout the western states uh, at the scale that is occurring right now. But wildfire is a major part of California's history, and it's something that um, has been suppressed for a long time, which is one of the reasons we're seeing such devastating impacts from it. Um, in 2017, here, the Tubbs fire came through, totally taking us off guard, catching us, you know, off guard, um, not expected at all, and it was quite devastating to our region. And then just this last winter, a year ago, we had the Kincaid fire come. Um, the Tubbs fire burnt 95% of the preserve, the Kincaid fire burnt about 60%, and then the overlap with the two fires here is in dark orange. And so one of the things we're doing with all of our research and monitoring at the preserve is we're looking at the impacts of these wildfires and also thinking about the more frequent fires we're having, the hotter fires that we're having, and how we can best steward the land. This is an aerial image after the Tubbs fire. That first prescribed burn I showed you was just right here. And so then the next spring, we, we did a, uh, an additional burn just adjacent to that area here, about 22 acres. This is to illustrate how prescribed burning can serve as weed management for, you know, it's a disturbance that enhances our grassland uh, ecosystem and promotes native grassland species. And it can also serve as a fuel break. Since the fuels were already burnt off, it did not burn in the Tubbs fire. And in fact, that's where our cattle went to survive the Tubbs fire. So when I first got here, you know, after we had kind of assessed Yes, our grasslands were grasslands historically, so let's make a conscious decision to manage them as grasslands. We needed to know what we were dealing with. What, you know, grassland communities are not well uh, characterized or categorized, they're very dynamic. And so we sought out to set a long-term monitoring project so that we can really get a sense of, of who was out there, how much was out there, and then how those how those um, grassland communities were responding to our management. And the way we set up our design is we have, right now we have 32 transects or these monitoring locations throughout the preserve. We tried to capture the variation at the preserve. So different slopes, aspects, 
different grassland communities and soil types. And then by um, getting down there and sampling the same space every year at the same time every year, we can really get a sense of the productivity of our grasslands, whether or not we have weedy species moving in, you know, how much bare ground or thatch do we have, which are indicators of our management. Are we grazing too heavy? Are we not grazing enough? And then all the benefits that arise from that, such as biodiversity. Um, 2011 was when we first uh, launched the project and we learned a lot. So that was a pilot year that we tend to kind of we put that data aside because we learned our lessons for the following, uh, what, 10 seasons. And then immediately when we, you know, the second year, we entered a historic drought. Uh, we brought on our new method of grazing with our rancher and collaborator, Holistic Ag. They, we work very closely with them to manage the cattle in a way where we have smaller cells or paddocks um, that we can move them through throughout the preserve. We can control the timing. We can control how much impact they have. Um, we can keep them out of areas. We can allow areas to rest for a long time. It's been a very um, positive uh, impact on the preserve. In 2015, we were in a peak drought. In 2016, Pepperwood had been developing a lot of climate products those previous years. And so we actually utilized those products to assess our, our design of this project and modify it to make sure we're capturing all of the, the extremes of those climate variables. And then 2017, boom, we have a historic water year right outside of that drought. In 2017, we also set up um, exclosures, which are basically a paired transect. So we have a transect here that we're monitoring that's allowed to be grazed and managed. And then we have a permanent fenced transect right next to it so that we can look at how um, grazing and release from grazing impacts our grasslands. Because it's very complex, as you can imagine, and the intersection and interactions between climate and grazing, it's, it's a lot to take in. So we really wanted to see the differences there. And then that historic water year set us up for the Tubbs fire. Another historic water set us up for, water year set us up for the Kincaid fire. We had our recent winter drought and entered a pandemic. And so these 10 seasons of data that we have collected, there has not been a single year that is typical or standard, right? This is, this is California for you. We're highly variable and uh, environmentally and climatically and um, it just speaks to how important long-term monitoring is. This is a 10-year data set, and we're just getting at some of the patterns and trends that are occurring here. Um, so I cannot advocate enough for long-term monitoring programs, especially since we are experiencing climate change right now. So this is what those transects look like. It's essentially a line running upslope so that we can capture variation in you know, soil types or um, soil water content. And we lay down this little square quadrat every five meters and we revisit that space from year after year. We're literally looking at the same patch of ground every year and asking questions like, how much rock or bare ground is there? How much grass cover or wildflower cover? And in one of these little corners here, I also look at every single individual species and characterize it that way. These are some images from one location year after year, taken at the same time every year. And you can see in 2011, when we started this project, there's a lot of thatch built up. Here we are moving deeper into the drought. You can see earlier dry down occurring. Here's the peak of the drought. Here's the spring following a historic water year, nice and lush, our Tubbs fire, and then the recovery after the Tubbs fire. Fire releases nutrients into the soils, and so you get a lot of growth after the fire, which you can really see right here in the foreground. So I'm going to show you some data generated by this project. I'm going to walk you through this graph here, and then most of the graphs following this are going to be very similar in their style. Um, and what I want to show you is there are the different sampling years that I'm going to present here on the bottom. This red bar is to remind you this is the historic drought. The blue bars are the historic water years. This red dash bar is the, is the fire, the Tubbs fire. 
I'm not showing 2020 because I'm still working on that data. So sorry, I didn't have it ready. Um, and this, these different colors represent the different kind of categories we're monitoring. And it's the average percent cover. So looking top down at that square, how much space or cover do these categories take up on average across all of our transects, all lumped together? So the dark brown in the bottom, that's the bare ground. And what you can see is over time, it started to increase. Well, let me tell you, we that sparked conversation, right? Here's an example of data going, something's happening. And it cued it. We weren't seeing it that we knew of. Uh, it wasn't obvious, but our data was picking up on something. So we started having adaptive management conversations. How much bare ground is too much? Is it all in one place? Is it distributed you know, all throughout? Is it reflecting our management? Um, do we need to fine tune our management? And then after the fire, of course, you see the most bare ground because everything burned away. And so it left a lot of space. But then we had recovery um, the second season after the Tubbs fire. The next color up is the dry material and, or uh, dry material thatch that you see. And um, the trend I'm going to show you has been documented in other long-term grassland studies, so it's not new to us. But what we see is an oscillation from a, you know, less dry matter cover to more, to less, to more, except for when there's a, you know, a really good water year. And that's inversely related to the amount of annual exotic grass cover. A lot of grass cover with a little bit of dry material. This grass cover lays down, becomes dry the next year with a little bit of green. So it's inversely related through the years. The blue you see are the non-grass wildflowers. The green represents the native, in this case, perennial bunch grasses. And what we saw over the years, uh-oh, we're getting a reduction. At the end of the drought, we saw a lot of dieback, especially of California oak grass, that more cool, climate preferring species. And again, sparking conversations, you know, is that agitated by or aggravated by our management? You know, what can we do? And what we are noticing is a slow recovery though, over time with more of these wet years, even with the fires, we're seeing recovery of it, which is good news. And then this light kind of pale peach color at the top, that's our invasive perennial bunch grass harding grass in this case, and our management is reducing it. That's what we do want to see. So there's both pros and cons going on here, and it's very complex, but it's really important and critical that we're looking at this on an annual basis to fine tune what we do. One of the metrics we like to look at is productivity, or and we, we look at that with our above ground biomass, which just means we give the grassland a little haircut and we separate the, the old, dry, oxidized material from the previous year from this year's growth. We dry it and we weigh it to see how much we're growing at that time. And this is what it looks like from year to year. Again, this red bar represents the tub fire, tubs fire. So the dry weight of fresh material stays relatively consistent. After the fire, there was a big burst of, you know, the most fresh weight biomass that we saw within our monitoring. And that's because of the release of those nutrients. And over time, the real good news here is our thatch um, levels were decreasing from our grazing and management. And of course, after the fire, there was very little left. Now with this burst of productivity, the next season, we went back to square, you know, square one. So there, one of the questions we had after the tubs fire, there was a lot of bare ground, everything was burnt away, it was a moonscape. We didn't know how well our grasslands were gonna recover. Well, they did very well. And one of the questions we had was, when should we bring our cows back on? And our answer was right away. You need to manage for this productivity because that will become thatched the next year, which is another fire risk. So we're very grateful that we brought our cows back on pretty much right away. And this here is one of those exclosures I mentioned that keeps the cattle out. And those grasses in there following the Tubbs fire were well over my head. The foreground, we brought our cattle through and you can see that we have a lot of material remaining. We opted to move them quicker through the area to leave more standing material to prevent erosion and you know, topsoil loss 
because of the increase of bare ground following the fire. So this is a really good example of how science and land stewardship can work together to enhance our, our ecosystem in California. Looking at the diversity of plant species in our grassland monitoring transects, sorry. Um, again, the years, the Tubbs fire, this is the total number of species that we see every year. And there's a general um, climbing or increase of species richness over the years. Where we really see the difference is within our um, exotic and native forbs, the wildflower species. The number of grass species tends to stay the same. So we're really happy to see that um, through management and most likely the fire too also increased um, our diversity of species we're detecting in our quadrats. So some of the adaptive management um, examples from that we can kind of glean from this data set are examples of early detection. One year we saw, this, this is the number of quadrats occupied by this species, goat grass. This is a really nasty invasive grass and it was invading one of our serpentine grasslands. And we went in right away after detecting it and it hasn't come back to that location. And we go back year after year to make sure that, that it doesn't get reoccupied. We can also monitor our native bunch grasses like purple needle grass. And we're seeing an increase from 43 quadrats to 78. And I should say these numbers take into account, I did not include additional transects we added after a while. These are just the same number of transects from year to year, the same transects. There's also a stability of native occurrence where we have our perennial California oak grass, the numbers, the quadrats, the number of quadrats occupied has stayed the same. Same with our invasive harding grass. It's where it is and it's gonna stay there. So we're really grazing and you know, using fire to try to reduce its reproductive output and to keep it from moving further uh, and expanding out from the, the areas it's already occurring in. There's new invaders like false brome and rosy sand crocus that through the years have increased quite significantly and we're watching these and thinking about, you know, how can we prevent it from, again, getting into new areas. And then there's plants that respond to fire like parenticellia. There were only two, but on average about 10 quadrats occupied and right after the Tubbs fire that doubled and carried over into 2019. We're also extensively monitoring our cattle, where they go, how long they're there, the impact they're having so that we can look at, you know, the impacts to our communities and whether or not that's driven by our grazing, driven by our grazing program. Um, these are maps that we just put together from all the grazing data from 2013 through June of this year. And it basically smushes all those years together and gives you the number of times grazed in this uh, graph on the left and the intensity at those locations on the right. Now there's some places where we, you know, there's a gate, so we have to bring the cattle in and out right here. And so you're gonna be there more frequently, but maybe your intensity isn't too high because you're there quick and moving fast. Um, there's areas where we stage them like after the fire. So that's why you see red here. But even so this intensity graph, which I should say the units here, if you're familiar with grazing intensity is animal unit months per acre. I'm not gonna go into what that is. It's just kind of how intensely we manage it. This is zero to two animal unit months per acre. That range from zero to two, even though it's on a color bar of green to red, it's really not red. We're within, well within the capacity that our preserve can withstand given the types of grasslands we have here. So the take home for me is that we're doing a very good job managing our cattle and making sure we're not overgrazing. Okay, this is the slide for me to go, let's just appreciate <laughs> the beauty of our grasslands. I've been talking a lot and talking fast and I do have some more I wanna share with you. Um, but this is why we do what we do, right? We love the beauty that we see right in front of us. So the next picture I'm gonna show you is not so pretty, right? We don't want this. We don't want this nastiness, but this happens. Sometimes there is a very rainy night, nobody's at the preserve, we come up the next morning and for some reason the cows all went to one spot and congregated right there and just, oh, and of course it's right by the road where everyone can see and we're going, no. 
The good news is this hardly ever happens. It occasionally happens. And from this event, I wanted to see, hey, it's an opportunity. I wanted to see how it recovers over time. So what I did is I set up a quick little transect and I compared heavily or high impact places with places directly adjacent that had very low impact. And that's what I'm gonna show you real quick, again, to kind of drive home the point that our grasslands are adapted to disturbance and recover quickly from disturbances, even ugly ones like this. So just visually looking from the bottom of the transect to the top, you can see the, the spring following some pretty good recovery. And especially over the years, you get good vegetative occupation of those bare soils. The top down was, this was a more heavily impacted site. And even four seasons following, you still can see that there's bare soil and probably some hoof punch here. Looking at the information from that site, the heavy hoof punch here is on the left. The light is on the right. So this is the reference vegetation, right? And right at the, after the initial event, that bare ground was extensive, but we started to see recovery with vegetation over time. The number of species that we saw was pretty low, relatively low, right? Um, right after the uh, hoof punch event, but immediately the number of species increased. Their cover might just not, it might have taken a little bit longer for the cover, but at least their presence was there. So resilience is the key. Even following fire, grasslands are gonna be some of the first that you see pop up. These are Stipopulcra, purple needle grass clumps, just not even a week after the Kincaid fire last year coming up. They're tapped into that groundwater with those deep roots and immediately they are coming back to life, providing food for the deer and wildlife that, that need green. So when you think of the lightning complex fires or the glass fire that recently came through, you know, rest assured the vegetation is recovering um, and providing food sources for the wildlife. With the Kincaid fire, um, that fire, because it wasn't as much of a surprise as the Tubbs fire. We knew it was coming. Cal Fire staged the firefight at the preserve. And what you see here are the bulldozer lines as they were stopping the fire. Um, what resulted was uh, we have now have 15 linear miles of bulldozer lines that we've been restoring in our grass, primarily in our grasslands. And so what we did is where they scrape the soils off, you know, we're trying to get that material back onto the bulldozer lines here, get those seeds back into that place, planting our plugs. These are um, purple needle grass plugs that we cultivated on site with volunteer help before the pandemic. And then we're starting to ask questions because we've had these back-to-back -back fires, we've had multiple prescribed fires too on top of that, how much fire is too much fire? We're gonna see more frequent fires in California. We're already seeing that. And this is an area where we had done prescribed burning for Medusa head that had perennial bunch grasses, native grasses. Well, after two prescribed burns and now two wildfires, it's a weed patch of storksville and this narrow leaf clover. These are both invasive weeds. So we really need to be cautious with our own land management not to put too much fire onto the land. And that's really hard to do when you don't know if a wildfire is gonna happen even this year. It's possible. That question of how much fire is too much fire um, applies to other habitat types like this chaparral you see here. This is a hand line carved by Cal Fire during the Kincaid fire that stopped the fire. On the right, this chaparral burnt once, on the left, it's burnt twice. When you have too much disturbance, whether it's cows or fire, you get conversion to grassland. And these are mostly exotic invasive grasses. So when I think of land stewardship in this context, this you know chaparral will burn so hot, it temporarily becomes a grassland community. And how can we steward that transitional phase so that we don't have weeds we don't have competition with those rare, you know, or uncommon fire followers. How can we really enhance this? How will the land recover? Bulldozer lines came through some of our long-term transects. This is the spring before the bulldozer and this past spring. 
We can ask how individual species or communities are gonna respond over time. But ultimately, I hope you realize that in our grasslands, they do recover. And this is after the Tubbs fire. I'm gonna show the next few slides are just for us to really enjoy and take in the beauty, the diversity, um, and the, the joy that grasslands can bring. If you notice, this is the one that both Holland and I, I have in our background. This is from um, Henley Flat after the Kincaid fire. It was absolutely spectacular this year. So I encourage you to get outside in spring. Maybe take your allergy medicine beforehand if you have allergies. Get down, look at what's there. There's textures and colors you can't imagine. It's a dynamic place, tiny little forest. And with that, thank you. Thank you for your time. Wonderful. Thank you, Michelle. So at this point, we could take questions. If anyone has questions for Michelle, you can type them into the chat and I can direct them to, to her. Um, and I, I see here also, Michelle, that you've added your email address. So thank you for that. Um, that's another way that you could uh, direct questions to her. Um, I see we didn't have any questions come in while you were speaking. I think people were probably just captivated by all the great information you were sharing. Um, so we'll give folks a few moments to share questions you might have. And okay, we've got a couple coming in here. Let's see. Uh, all right, so in the beginning, you mentioned how grasslands change can occur in such small areas, a different grassland if you walk a few feet in one direction or the other. Wondering how this info applies to a residential property. Would love to incorporate native perennial grasses in my yard, but unclear about how to be skillful about it. That's a great question. Yeah, so, you know, that variability across the landscape really comes, it, it, it's a, an, a representation of what's happening underneath, right? The soils might be different. There might be, you know, gopher holes or shallow soils or a little wet area that changes the whole community. So if your backyard has different aspects to it, then you might consider, oh, here's a, here's a mound where I have shallower soils, maybe rockier soils. You might have different species that do better there, right? So we're always considering the matrix that we're growing our plants in. And I should say the California Native Plant Society, as well as the California Native Grassland Association are both really fabulous um, organizations that have a lot of information about how to incorporate native plants into your landscaping, as well as how to steward, you know, native plants that occur on your property. They have identification guides too, so that you can learn more and they host classes throughout the region. So you can learn how to, you know, go and explore your own backyard and know how to steward it. Great question. Excellent. And another question we've got um, here is, if we had a choice of being or not being a staging area for the fire, what would it be? Thank you for bringing that up. So um, of course we would choose to be a staging area. Right, we all experience personal tragedy um, with the Tubbs fire. Those of us that are in this region experience personal tragedy. And um, there's no question or doubt, we are extremely grateful to Cal Fire for holding the line. It was a firefight, it was a very wind driven event at that time. And so, um, you know, they were doing the best they could with the tools that they have. And they worked very well with us to come back and try to recontour some of the bulldozer lines. And then we went in as stewards and did additional work and we're continuing to do work. Um, our neighbors, you know, uh, our own property, we just had a rebuild. Our land manager just moved in three years later to his new home that was finally finished building here on the property at Pepperwood. And so it would have been devastating had we lost all of that. But here's an opportunity for us to work with, you know, firefighters and agencies that are holding the lines and, and trying to prevent fire. Um, we have an opportunity to work with them on fuels management, 
right? Better managing our forests and grasslands so they don't burn fast or hot. Um, working with them on the tools to fight fire. Maybe there's other methods. There's a lot of discussion right now, especially since there's so much fire happening. Um, what are the best ways we can do it with, with the ecosystem and conservation um, skills that we need? That was a little bit rambling, but I <laughs> hope you got my take home. <laughs> yeah, that was great, Michelle. Another question we have is when you're planting for restorations, are you planting both grass and forbs and in what proportion? Yeah, so we mostly plant grass plugs because we have found that to be consistently successful. Um, we plant them in winter when they are getting rainwater and they can establish their root systems enough that they can outcompete and survive, you know, in the spring and summer months. We have tried seeding uh, wildflower species, various clovers, lupins to different areas that were impacted. And that has uh, a lot lower success levels and it can be very expensive at the scale at which we are doing it. So there's all kinds of information out there about various seed mixes you can use. There's a wonderful um, or, uh, company called Hedgerow Farms out, I think it's outside of Davis, maybe in Woodland, California. And they grow, some of the photos I showed of the grasses like squirrel tail grass are from, from Hedgerow Farms. They grow native seeds exactly for restoration purposes. And they have a lot of information about where those seeds have come from. So you can try to genetically be in alignment with your region and not sourcing seed from too far away, but also the characteristics or, you know, or how those plants might behave out in the ecosystem. So some plants might be a little bit more weedy and get an advantage over others. There's a lot of information. So I recommend checking them out. Excellent. Uh, let's see, I see we've got another question come in. Um, this is a clarification about the residential grasses question. Um, I shouldn't have used the word yard because I'm anti-yard, um, trying to prioritize supporting native pollinators, lots of wildflowers. So my question is more, um, how small of an area might be sustainable for native perennial grasses when tucked amongst areas of native wildflowers? One small area, multiple small areas, one large area, half grass, half wildflowers. Um, is it variable from property to property depending on environmental conditions? Uh, North Coast uh, CNPS has been a great resource thus far, but I've not seen much emphasis on grasses. Yeah, so I mean, different grasses are going to be found in different um, environmental conditions. So that's where I would start. And I think it's totally up to you, right? I've seen some folks plant the typical yard with lots of grasses and not much else. But if you want more of a natural diversity, you can see a lot of those photos, there's like this natural clumping that kinds of, kind of occurs. Um, there's or natural spacing, I should say. So maybe you mimic that. Um, I think there's a lot of room for creativity with this. And I encourage you to just explore and, and try, um, try some things out. Personally, I would give space and uh, think about irrigation. Because if you have, you know, if you have your wildflower species that you're irrigating versus those that, you, you know, versus the grasses that may not prefer irrigation, that obviously is a big uh, input on where you put things. Now, this is a, a question that I'm interested to hear your answer on as well. Um, what places would you recommend in Sonoma, in Sonoma County to go see stands of native grasses? Pepperwood. <laughs> we actually have, uh, not just because I love Pepperwood, but we really do have um, a lot of locations on the preserve where you'll often see seven to nine native grass species, such as our barn meadow, which is very easily accessible. Right now we're not open to the public. Um, we don't have, you know, our regular hikes, but we do have opportunities to schedule private hikes through our learning landscapes program. And that information is online and, and Holland is going to share it in the chat here. Um, so 
other places, you know, all of our state parks, regional parks, there's going to be places where there are native grasses. It's really hard to find those stands that you're kind of referring to where it's nothing but. Um, it's usually a mosaic and intermixed places that have serpentine, right, or shallow soils, those rocky soils, you tend to find more of your endemic and native grasses and wildflowers. Those are places I would go. Excellent. Yeah, I did. I dropped um, in the chat there a link to our learning landscape program, which is a way to book a private hike for you and your group of 10 folks that um, you can come out and see Pepperwood. And we do also plan to offer some wildflower walks in the spring, small group walks, you know, with um, all health safety measures in place. So that will be another opportunity to, to keep an eye out for. And I'll just wrap things up. And as I'm wrapping up, I'll keep an eye to see if any other questions come in. And again, I want to say thank you to Michelle for a great presentation with tons of great info. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. And we do have some upcoming uh, opportunities for you to participate in some other programs we have soon, such as um, coming up actually starting next week, we have a special four week mini course called Learning to See Your Landscape. And this is with um, uh, wildlife ecologist and educator, Megan Walla Murphy. We have a class on birding basics with one of our educators, Nicole Barden, a presentation on our wildlife picture index, which you saw a number of great uh, wildlife pictures from today that will be with our wildlife specialist, Stephen Hamrick. And on December 4th, we are super excited to be hosting the Wild and Scenic Film Festival as a virtual live stream event. So you can find out how to register for any of these on our website. And I also invite you to follow us on social media. This particular webinar will be up on our YouTube channel within about a week. So if you want to revisit it or share it with colleagues or friends, that will be the place to find it. Let me just check the chat to see if we had any more questions come in. It doesn't look like it. So with that, we will wrap it up and I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks again for all of your interest and we hope to see you again in the future.